everybody move this way again. Okay, there's this. Okay. Remember your spots. Okay, we're moving Shubham to number two. Okay. Where was he at originally at four? four. Yeah. Okay. Go. And so the first picture we're going to use um, is the Mars occultation. What about what's in the sky? Yeah, we'll do that. We're, that's just kind of our intro. Okay. Like, hey, what have you been imaging? Yeah, I got you. Okay. What's up, dude? You guys are getting really fancy here. This is awesome. Am I already there? Oh, oh I'm... Mike check, Mike check, still good. And also, Your audio is back on. All right. I can mute you guys. Okay, I, I'll do the intro, you do the close. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> All right, we're getting close. It's game time. They can't hear me. Oh. Hey, Ross, am I on the thing, please? You can't hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Hey, Shubham. So glad you're here. You can hear me in the background. Okay, now, Shubham, I can't see you right now, but I can hear you, and uh, thank you so much for being here. Shubhan. Wait, we can't see you? It's not your fault. Yeah, I see him. His, his camera's working fine. You excited, man? Yeah. I'm yeah, excited. you nervous? We're nervous too, Shubhan. It's okay. No, don't be nervous. You guys just have fun. That's all. No, nah, we will. I want to see. I'm ready to see some of your images, man. We only got one that we could load. So we'll post them up later. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Down the hill. Um,
dude, this is confused. I can't. Can we close that door? Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that little featurette there. Um, I know that it doesn't really go with astrophotography, but it was so cool. So, uh, and so I just had to show it. But uh, this is our second episode of Focus on Astrophotography, and we've got uh, Chuck and Ross here with us and Cameron. And um, uh, we have our special guest here from India. And uh, so, uh, uh, Ross, if you'd like to... Um, Go ahead and make some introductions here. That'd sure be great. Thing. I'd love to, Scott. Thank you so much for letting us be here. Uh, we are super excited about having our own show. Um, I've never been on a live <laughs> YouTube show before. I don't know about you, Chuck. No, this is a first for me, for sure. This is, yeah, this is a first, but we are super excited and we are super grateful and we love astrophotography. So that's what we want to talk with you all about. We want to uh, field your questions have some fun and uh, we'll see what we can do. And um, so, yeah, I, uh, I had the good fortune of getting a phone call from a kid in India, from Nagpur, India, and he has an Explore Scientific PMC mount. And he called and he just, he wanted to get that mount perfect. This, this guy, when he was talking to me the first time, I thought, and he must be 
30 something years old. He mm-hmm. sounds like a grown man and he is incredibly smart. Um, and so we helped get his mount working and we helped get everything running right. And uh, Shubham and I have continued our relationship. And I am so grateful for that. Mr. Shubham Sean, Sean Travanshi. Um, and I know I butchered that last name and I, I greatly apologize for it because his last name is incredibly important. It means from the moon back to uh, the Bhagavad Gita. And so Shubham, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'm glad that I got this opportunity to be on this show. Yeah, I'm glad. Well, you certainly deserve it, man. And so I had the opportunity to interview Shubham yesterday. And um, I asked him, you know, how did he become interested in astrophotography? And I thought this was a great story because it was, it came from his grandparents. They lived out in the country on a farm and they would sleep outside on cots. And he had never seen the, the Milky Way like that. Not in the city. I think his city has a few million people. And he said every night he was out there, he would see shooting stars. And so that really just sparked his interest. And you begin saving money, right, Shubham? Yeah, when I was like in eighth grade or so, same thing. Hey, you saved money for a long time, I think. Uh, Almost five years you were saving your money. And, uh, you know, then Shubham had to help his family out and he stepped up to the plate and did that. And why don't you tell the audience, Shubham, how you got your equipment? Because I think that's fascinating. Yeah, so what happened was um, that, uh, as you all know, I follow some famous astrophotographers on YouTube. So one of them is Chuck A.U. from Chuck's Astrophotography. So one day he just posted a video on YouTube, uh, in which he uh, dropped his Celestron uh, C8 uh, telescope from 7 or 8 foot of height. Uh, just he, dro- he dropped it off the roof of his house, right? Uh, no, he climbed the ladder and then <laughs> from there he dropped it. So, and you thought, I, I could have used that scope. That was an awesome uh, telescope. He, he had a, he actually had two of them and the one he dropped was uh, broken a little bit maybe its focuser was broken so he just um, decided to destroy it completely and posted a video so and what you uh, you uh, commented on a on yeah. that video yeah. and some guy in Germany right yeah so I commented on that video. Uh, about how I felt seeing that. So, from somebody uh, whose name was Lasoja Kasper from Bulgaria uh, commented me back and um, he gave his email. We talked, we had a healthy conversation on email, and he was like, Oh, this, guy's, uh, this guy knows so much about space and astronomy um, that he doesn't have any equipment to do that actually so he was like maybe i can gift you and uh, yeah we con- we had a conversation back and forth so but due to customs in india he, de- he decided that he will buy me a telescope um, brand new from a local dealer here in india and that's how i got that telescope yeah, well, uh, I think Chuck and I agree. We can uh, thank Germany for that. That is pretty awesome. And we're, we're really happy you got our mount. We're really happy you're uh, getting to look up there now, Shubham. And, you know, yesterday I asked you about some of your other interests. These are robotics, electrical engineering, computer science. Uh, I've seen your Instagram page. You're constantly building stuff. Uh, what is your Instagram handle, Shubham, for all your fans out here now? So... It's underscore Shubham underscore Chandravanshi. Um, we'll we'll put a link to that Shubham on yeah. uh, on our site when we get when we get done here. Sure. Um, we uh, that we actually got started the same way, man. Uh, I, I I got into astrophotography around 2016, but it wasn't until I got out of 
out of a city and into the country, we actually bought a house outside of the city. And that was literally my first time seeing the Milky Way. So it, it's great to hear that, you know, we kind of had this, a similar start in astrophotography. So I like hearing that. I know a lot of people that that's how they get their start. They don't, a lot of people don't, they really, they you see, a, they you see Orion, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you're living in a city, you see Orion and that's pretty much it, but you don't realize that you could drive 30 minutes out of a city and see a million stars. So no, it's, it's a whole nother, it's a whole nother ball game getting out of that light pollution. Yeah, uh, luckily for us, astrophotography um, can be quite successful in light pollution, but Shubham, you know, you remember I asked, uh, I asked a wild question, like, you know, if you could have any piece of equipment on earth, what would it be? And, you know, he just smiled, shook his head and said, that is too crazy, Ross. I'm just grateful for what I have. So, you know, that's why I thought this guy definitely deserves to be our first astrophotographer that we're going to focus on and that we want to highlight. And, uh, you know, so if anybody watching, you know, they know somebody that, you know, is pretty cool like Shubham, we'd love to feature them as well. And so right now you don't even have a camera, right, Shubham? Yes, I don't have a camera. Yeah, you you're renting a DSLR when when you can. Um, yeah. And so I mean, he is efforting, um, you know, way more than I think Chuck and I are to get these pictures, and we are super proud of him. Reach out to after the show. Get with me. I'll, I I might be able to help you out with that. I'll, I'll find you. I'll, I'll find you. Uh, find uh through Instagram, I'll get with the Ross and I'll get your handle and I'll, I'll reach out to you on that. Yeah. And just, I just wanted, you know, show really who, you know, who I've gotten to know here, um, over there in the heart of India. And so I asked Shubham, you know, what makes him the happiest, right? And he looked at me and almost, almost started crying. And he said, he's the happiest when his little brother's looking up at him and I just, you know, he's a really awesome guy. Is he in it with you? How old is he? How old's your little brother? He's 10. He's 10? Yeah. That's awesome. Is he uh, Is he getting into it with you? Like when you're imaging, is he out there with you? Uh, yeah. He, he, he remains open till 12 or 1 in, uh, in the midnight when I image or when I just observe the stars and uh, he also takes interest in astronomy too. Well, hey, why don't, uh, now Shubham, we, I apologize, we are only able to upload one of your images today, um, but we're going to share it here and we'll put the rest of them on, uh, Mars Oscillation. yes, sir, we'll put the rest of your images on, um, on the page afterwards so everyone can see the work that you do and um you know so he's using dss deep sky stacker to stack his images and he's got a real old version of photoshop that he puts it all together with and do we have i we can't see it we've got the mars oculation up there now yeah awesome right. awesome well why don't you tell us how you got that photo shubham so this is the picture of Mars occultation by moon, uh, which happened on just a few months ago uh, when Mars came from behind the moon and it was visible in India. So I had my telescope set up on my rooftop and uh, so I had a 15 millimeter eyepiece which gave me around 50 or 60 times the magnification which is the maximum i have currently so i just put my smartphone on the eyepiece and through okay. the, through the eyepiece projection technique i uh, captured that moon and there's a very little tiny red dot uh, visible just above the horizon of the moon so, so that is mars actually which came from behind the moon so yeah, it's not quite clearly visible to me now. Well, you got it. You got it, and it's there, Shubham. So, what I, do you? I, oh, I'm sorry, no, Ross. Go, go, go. What are you imaging right now? Are you working on? You have any projects going right now? Um, not particularly, but when I go to the country, uh, to my grandparents' house, 
I rent a DSLR from there and I just photograph the Milky Way or some like Andromeda Galaxy and Orion constellation. So yeah, I I once tried to capture the Barnard slip in the Orion constellation. So it it was actually pretty faint because uh, I had only exposed for thirty second maximum. And uh, it wasn't a long exposure, so I couldn't capture clearly. But yeah, when I go to the countryside, uh, I try to capture wide field targets. Well, hey, we are we are really grateful. Thank you. I don't know if anybody has realized it yet, but uh, it's like four in the morning. What time is it there, Shubham? Hmm? What Sorry, what I time is it? That. What time is it now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's two fifty a.m. Uh, in the morning here. Uh, the so night. he stayed up late. He stayed up super late. <laughs> like, talk to y'all. He's an astronomer. He's a. This is prime time, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it is his prime time. That is very <laughs> true. Well, Shubham, thank you so much, man. And uh, we're gonna put your pictures up later. We'll put your uh, Instagram tag and. Um, you know, maybe somebody from the Tata family is going to be calling you for a job. I'm not sure, brother, but <laughs> you're the man. And thank you yeah, for your I photos hope. and your time. Yeah, right. you're welcome. All right. Have a good one, man. All right. Yeah. Well, I think that was a pretty good first segment, Chuck. I yeah, no, that was good. awesome. Okay, well, let's keep the ball. Let's keep the ball rolling. Um, so the you guys wanted us to talk about planetary imaging. And unfortunately, Chuck and I are not the best planetary mm -hmm. imagers, but we know a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, have you, do you have much experience? I mean, with the moon, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I would say. I mean, I've imaged the planets, but I haven't put as much effort in it as like a deep sky object. Um, the great thing about imaging planets, um, if you're already into astrophotography, you really don't need to go out and buy a new camera to image planetary because if you have a color guide camera, you could just, that's what I did. I used my color. I had a color guide camera. I think it was a uh, um, ASI 120MC. And I just used that to image most of the planets that I have done. So um, I think Ross knows a little bit more than me on the planet. So, <laughs> well, that, that maybe. But, um, you know, I did pull up. Uh, July is a great month for imaging the planets. Um, you're, you're really going to get uh, your best time is at the end of July and early August to visit, uh, well, to see the big guys, Jupiter and Saturn. Um, but you can also get a good shot of Venus. And um, you want a lot of images. You want a lot, a lot, a lot of images if you're going to do planetary. Um, it's called, what's that called? It's called uh, lucky imaging. You yeah, lucky imaging. Lucky. All right. And we all want to get lucky. So you take 10,000 photos. And you have them cropped because you don't need the full frame and it's going to be a lot harder for your image to stack if you've got a huge huge picture for it to a, a lot more data for it to process so you just make your uh you just crop that image around your moon and you set that shutter speed just as almost as fast as you can um you know you watch your histogram and you see where it's at and then you i use auto stacker um and so why don't we show them the four moon photo uh for fun uh i was using the color camera it was the a tick horizon um and that was the first first version of it that was the first camera i ever got um and i had some uh hydrogen oxygen and sulfur 12 nanometer filters from astronomic and like i said i'm not a great moon photographer the last one is the uh luminance channel that's why it's kind of really bright but i, I Thought it was interesting just to see what the moon looked like in the different wavelengths of light. And, uh, but you want to stack and you want as many photos as you can. And then you want to select a small percentage of them. Um, I know guys that are selecting 5% of their photos. Uh, just when it is, when that sky clears for just a split second and it's very stable, you want a stable air um because everything's moving really fast and you're pop 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 getting so many pictures and then you'll put them in auto stacker or registax and it 
if you can do DSS, Deep Sky Stacker, you will have no problem with that. Um, it, they, it's great software. Um, and also a bunch of, so if you're new to astrophotography and if you got one of the, you know, the recommended uh, deep sky cameras out there, you can actually do planetary imaging with that camera also. You just need to go to, what is it, high dynamic range mm -hmm, under the mm -hmm. settings and shoot, I would say one second probably, so it's not well, blown out. I, I, I'm always like it. For the moon? Yeah, for the moon. Uh, I have, I there's, the one guy I follow on Astrobin that, that is really a great planetary imager, I think he's doing like 30 frames a second. Okay. Um, and so over the course of an hour or two, he's going to have gigs and gigs and gigs of data. Um, so when you get it all, you keep 5, 10, 15% of them and get rid of the rest. Um, but, you know, it, it will fill your memory up quick and you can get great photos. They've done um, the moon like a... Where they where they take the light and it's a uh, mineral. Yeah. Um, so you can Google search some uh, mineral moon shots and those are those are quite beautiful. Um, I also love the moon uh, for its ability to um, give us perspective. Okay. So a lot of the times when you're seeing an ast uh, a photograph of the sky, you're really not sure your field of view. How big is that thing up there in the air? And so the moon really gives a good reference point. And uh, early on, I took a image of the Sol Nebula, and then I added the moon to it as a reference shot. So you could really get an idea of just how big the Sol Nebula is in Cepheus. Um, and it could, if we could share that one, I think that's uh, that's an interesting photo um, and because people don't realize like. There are clouds in the sky. Oh, that's way awesome. Way bigger than that moon. Yeah. And also, the good thing is, it's not a faint object. So, you don't need four hours of data mm -hmm. to get a good image. So, no, that's awesome. And also, uh, I believe the ASI 533 MC Pro and the ASI 294 MC Pro mm -hmm. are both capable of planetary imaging. Just mm -hmm. again, you have to go into the settings on that camera where you would uh, change up the gain and offset on it and just select high dynamic range. Mm -hmm. And that will give you the right uh, settings so you can actually image something that's very bright. Yeah, and um, I have, I've taken one picture of Saturn and um, you know, I'm not proud of it, but I will share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter as, yeah. long, as long as you got out there and had fun and took some exactly. images. Exactly. And, you know, that's the thing about astrophotography. Um, I remember my first images, they're, they're not very good at all. Mm -mm. Um, but to me, I loved them. I mean, I got so much satisfaction, so much pleasure out of these horrible pictures. And you will feel the same way. I mean, it doesn't matter what your first picture is. Uh, when you get one, you will love it. Now, my first six months of astrophotography, I had, of course, I was told I needed a fill flattener. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a field flattener on the back in front of my camera, but the back spacing was spacing. probably off by like 50 mm -hmm. milliliters. Mm -hmm. So luckily I was using an RC telescope. So that has a flat, you know, it doesn't have a lot of curvature to it. So luckily I was getting round stars, but that's just one thing of like many things that I just, just went right over my head. So yeah, as long as you're just getting out there and having fun, uh, it doesn't really matter on, you know, quality right now so right now the that will come the quality will come and they they do talk about the steep learning curve oh yeah um and and it is there is a lot of stuff to know but you don't have to be anywhere up that learning curve to enjoy it um you know a, a, it's the process that's what's enjoyable and it's getting out there getting under the stars um being outside and uh being precise, working on something, spending time on one image and, and putting the work in. And that's why I like it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, what are what are you imaging right now, Chuck? Yeah, well, right now it's kind of ironic because the next segment, but I'm actually working on the Crescent Nebula. Okay. I think right now I have two hours with it. Um, right now I'm shooting it with an ED-127 triplet. Um, with the FCD 100 glass, I have our 0.7 in the back. So that actually drops that F ratio from F 
uh, 7.5 to 5.25 and brings that focal length down to 666. So I'm getting a, it's basically I'm shooting really fast. That's so you? I, uh, no, oh. that is an A-pod. Okay. So, but that just goes to show you what you can achieve. I do have another image that we're going to show next that is mine. Um, that's the North American Nebula, but that is what I'm working on right now. I'm actually using uh, the Optolong Optolong um, Enhance or uh, Extreme? That'll Extreme, that dual narrowband filter to capture it. So I'm going to try to get a couple more hours of it before I started processing. But I'm working on that. I'm also going back to the Owl and Surfboard uh, oh, yeah. Nebula. Oh, yeah. So I'm working In on... 98? I'm not even sure yeah. right now. Okay. I'm working on two objects right now, so hopefully I'll have those done in, uh, sometime this month. So what about you? Well, right. You know, I am not a great planner. Um, you know, one my biggest problem, I took uh, my telescope to Colorado recently with my five-year-old son, and uh, I wanted him to get to hike up a mountain before he got in kindergarten. And uh, so I bring the telescope up, we set it up there, and we are out of cell phone service. And uh, you know, I'm thinking, well, I don't even know what the, I don't even know what to take a picture of. I got everything out there and set up. And, uh, you know, planning is really one of the most important stages. Uh, you're going to have so much data. You have so much to do that uh, when you're ready to image, you you don't want to waste any time. Um, so I really don't know what I'm going to take a picture of tonight because mm -hmm. uh, Chuck and I are going to image together tonight. And it'll be our first time to do that, too. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh but I do love Cygnus, and so that is what's going to take us to our next segment. And I'm super excited about this one, and I can't wait to see where it goes. But this is Chuck's Constellation Crunch. And we're going to take those constellations, and we're going to crunch them down for mm. you and tell you all the cool stuff. <laughs> I'm going to have to make, like, a sound effect that has, like, this crunching noise of, you know, it's not the Big Bang, it's the Big Crunch. So. Uh. Yeah. No, yeah, we need some type of sound effect it. for that. I love it. <laughs> it's cool. But for this, uh, for this week, I picked Cygnus, um, aka the Northern Cross, to some sailors out there. But the reason I picked that is whenever I associate that to uh, deep sky season. When you start getting late, in, late into summer, that's when the Milky Way starts to rise, and of course, the Cygnus falls in front of the Milky Way. Um, so I was just going to go over some facts on it, a little bit of the background, how it got its name, some of the stars that are in that constellation as far as deep sky objects. So Cygnus, like I said, AKA the Northern Cross, um, it actually got its name from the Greeks, which means swan and, and mythology. It's actually Zeus in disguise. It's really, mm. it's Zeus in disguise to go see one of his lovers. And the two brightest stars in the constellation is Saturn and uh, Deneb. How mm -hmm. do you pronounce it? I pronounce it Deneb. I pronounce it Deneb. But Sadar is a 2.23 magnitude star, and it's also 1,826 light years from Earth. Uh, and, Deneb that, and, and, and Sadir or Sadar is full of nebula. Oh, yeah. I mean, just you, you put Sadar in the middle. And you turn that exposure up, and you're gonna see some hydrogen. Yeah, no, it's everywhere. It's that's a great image. Uh, that's a great a region to image. But with Sadar, that's no with Deneb, that is a 1.24 magnet uh, magnitude star, and it's 222 hundred light years from Earth. And a cool fact about that star is, if you were to replace Vega with that star. It would be so bright. It would actually cast a shadow over the Earth at night. It's actually the 19th brightest star in the sky. And uh, well, so, I had no, I did not know that. Yeah, it's cool. The the two like most well known nebulas in that constellation is of course the North American Nebula and also the Crescent Nebula. They're both emission nebulas. Um, I was going to go into the North American. Yeah, Do we on, have the wide field of the? Uh yeah, it's the no, do S -A -D -R. the do North American. Oh, we do that one for a Yeah. Okay. We'll get that pulled up. But yeah, the North American Nebula is awesome. No, that's the other um, one. And uh, I mean, yeah. So this is actually one of my first objects that I did. Um, this is with, with a DSLR. I think it was the Rebel T Rebel T seven and just. 
a lens basically to get the whole thing in view. Oh, yeah. I don't know of a telescope that can get the whole uh, nebula in view. I know most telescopes under 350 uh, focal length, and if you're using at least a four-third sensor, you can get the part of the nebula that looks like the United States. But to get the whole region, you're going to need a camera with a wide lens on it. But going back to the North American Nebula, William Herschel actually discovered it in October of 24th, 1787, but it wasn't cataloged until his son did it, John Herschel, in August of 2021, 1890, uh, <laughs> 1829, and they named it the NGC 7000. But believe it or not, in 1890, our pioneer astrophotographer Max Wolf was our the pioneer. Yeah, that was great. That he was, was great. the first person to actually image it. And when he imaged it, he was doing long exposures and he was actually able to get the shape of the nebula and see, wow, this thing actually looks like the United States. I actually pulled up, we have a picture of the camera that he used to, uh, to take that image. That's cool. Love that camera. Wow. Wow, that's very cool. And, oh. the, and oh. then in 1922, the man, the myth, the legend, Edwin Hubble proposed that the reason that the North America nebula was so lit up was actually from the star like I said, Deneb, lighting up the nebula. Well, I've heard, and, um, you know, I can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I've heard that if you hold a hydrogen filter up just with your eye up there, that you can you can kind of see some of uh, the North American nebula. Oh, I have no idea. That. That's cool. I'm going to try that tonight yeah. once it gets high enough. Um, another another fact I didn't, I didn't say about the North American nebula, um, is uh well it's not really a fact but basically if you do want to image that nebula i would recommend if you're if you wanted to just get the american part of it i would suggest something below 300 focal length and at least a four-third sensor for that object really you need a four-thirds and higher um if you want to capture the whole image like i said i would go with a full frame with a wide lens mm -hmm. on it but uh moving back to the crescent nebula which is a missions nebula also this is 5,000 light years from Earth, so pretty far away, and it was discovered by William Herschel in 1792. Um, a cool fact about how it got its shape is it's actually got its shape from fast stellar wind from the wolf ray at star 136 colliding and energizing with a slower moving wind, which was ejected by the star when it became a red giant. Roughly, they say 250 to 400,000 years ago, that's that is, crescent. yeah, you can go back to the Crescent Nebula on that one. Or, or we can do the white field and we can show the tulip and the, yeah, you here can. It's the SADR um, Crescent. Perfect. Yeah. So you can actually see the Crescent Nebula. And the reason what, what I just said from the fast stellar wind coming off that star, that's how it actually got its shell. But basically, it got a shell from two shockwaves moving inward and outward. Because if you study it, it's not, they're not moving in opposite directions. They're actually moving into each other. So that's what gives it that, that a crescent. I, it more looks like a, I guess it does look like a crescent, but a crescent shell. Yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to name a lot of these objects. But uh, I will say those Wolf Riot, um, they will really make some cool nebulas. Uh, Thor's helmet, that's another one. Yeah. And uh, just, fascinating nebulas i think they're I, I am not uh the most factual guy smartest guy in, in this but mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure they're the hottest or some of the hottest stars and they they create very awesome nebulas yeah and going back to the crescent nebula this is the one that i'm actually shooting right now um i had a debate of with the ed127 if you're just using you know let's say you don't have a reducer on there um, it's 950 focal length. So you could actually go up a little bit. I think you could actually go up to 1600 with a wide enough sensor. You could get really, uh, well, can't get close up, but you can zoom in on it. Um, but the reason I went with putting that 0.7 reducer on the back first, so I could shoot faster, but also there's nebula coming off that Seda region that crops into where the crescent is. And I'm trying to capture some of that. So, um, like I said, with a faster scope, you don't have to take as much. Well, your imaging time goes down a little bit, so you don't have to get as much images. But 
there's a lot with that that's, one. That's the on the, on the side there. You can see the Seder region, and then on the other side, that's the you can see a small another nebula that's, that's fairly well defined, and that's the Tulip Nebula. It's one of those SH two. Yeah, uh, Ross. Shapeless. Yeah, I'm gonna let Ross talk a little bit more about this because Ross actually just imaged it, but he imaged it wide field. So I was gonna let him go into that a little bit. I was just saying, if you want to zoom in on that, you really, any scope on the market is going to be able to frame just the crescent, mm -hmm. but you're not going to get the good stuff around it. That's why, you know, we need to talk to Ross because yeah. he's the wide field expert on this. Well, I, I do really enjoy wide field. Um, and right now I'm shooting at 200 millimeters. Uh, and then I, I also have uh, a little bit longer focal length and then the uh, 102 millimeter ED carbon fiber and uh but but right now because it's uh well i'm ready for nebula season um it galaxies i find fascinating but um i i need a bigger scope i need a i need a bigger scope if i if i really want to get the galaxy so i, I started shooting wide field i have a side-by-side -side setup um i mean you can just build and build and build with this equipment you can go broke yeah well you, <laughs> it's you, never enough equipment deep deep into debt but mm -hmm. uh that's all right because uh we love what we do so um yeah but what camera are you using with it so i did yeah speaking of you can go broke um i got the qhy 600 mono yeah You're shooting mono yeah. With it? and uh, i love it more <laughs> it's, detail it's really awesome um it's really awesome and i you know, um, I hope my wife isn't watching because she does not know how expensive it is. Um, but that's all right. And it was my, it's my first mono camera. And that image you saw there of Seder, Crescent, and the Tulip, uh, that was my first color image. Uh, my first uh, SHO show image. That's not in the Hubble palette. Uh, the Hubble palette didn't really look that pleasing to me on that image. Um, but that is only... Uh, hydrogen light, sulfur light, and oxygen light. So there is no full spectrum. That is just the emission, uh, the emission wavelengths there. And so um, that's why I like Cygnus with a wide field or Cepheus because it's just there's so much going on. And uh, especially when um, I mean it, where 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 we are, I think the Milky Way rises one o'clock. Around there, two o'clock. Well, anyway, a wide field setup is perfect for any of those objects in the Milky Way. If it's, you know, the lagoon, if it's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, name some. Well, <laughs> not... I, I mean, the lagoon is always behind a tree. Eagle. For me. Yeah, the eagle, uh, the omega. Um, but so I have to stay more toward the, toward the northern sky. I know everybody is battling something. Um, and... Gosh, astrophotography, it always seems like every night something is going to go wrong, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess I will tell you about one one thing that happened to me, and it's kind of embarrassing, but uh, but that's all right. Um, it's been all night. I got all this set up. Everything is right. My mount is perfectly level. I'm right on uh, Polaris, right where it should be. I spend the time to polar align it. Everything is balanced. Everything's hooked up. Cameras hooked up, uh, focusers hooked up. Um, everything should be working, and it's not working. Um, and you, I mean, if you take astrophotography, um, you understand the frustration of of the endeavor. And so I'm just getting so frustrated, and I'm about to call it quits. And I've been spending hours troubleshooting, troubleshooting, and um, the lens cap was on my <laughs> so don't let that happen to you that's that, that don't let that happen to you yeah no nah, we will that, that, that used to happen when you had film cameras okay and you could not see what was going on you know you would you would have the lens cap left on you'd do all this work guide all the shot everything take it back and get into the uh -huh. dark room and realize that there were zero exposures you know so now, so I've never done a lens cap, but I have done two hours with the um, with the star mask. What, what is it? To focus. Uh, oh, the Batonoff mask. Yeah, the Batonoff Bat mask. <laughs> I have done two hours of data with that on it. So, well, so many times I I've spent a whole night and uh, I would forget to click to turn the uh, cooler on, 
or I would forget to click save or I mean there there's a lot of things that are going to go wrong and uh, that's why we're here yeah you know we're going to try to help you get through these things and uh, to share our struggles with you and hopefully you can share your struggles with us um so but we are looking um for questions from you guys and ways we can help we are going to have telescopes here we're gonna if you've got a question we might just go run to the room pull the telescope out and show you how how to uh, solve your problem yeah basically we're going to be starting and uh, the point of the show is to help y'all and also you know get a you know a fellowship together so you know we can help each other out even share data but basically we want to start from the ground up Mo the common household usually pretty much everyone has at least one dslr or i know everyone has a cell phone in their pocket mm -hmm. so you don't have to go out if you're interested you don't have to go out and spend thousands and thousands of dollars with you know help from us and you know other astrophotographers you can start imaging tonight if tonight. you have even if you have a cell phone right and, there or cell phone yeah and if i mean you're going to need a tripod but you can get a tripod for what fifteen dollars and you can start imaging so that's what we're going to be covering like he said we're going to be doing tutorials we're going to show you how to set up you know your telescope how to start imaging what software you need how to process it like i said from the ground up that's what we're here for and uh as Shubham had told me, uh, he loves taking the photos because he loves to share them. He, he loves giving them to his family and seeing their expressions and, um, you know, feeling like he's inspiring people. And so send us your photos, inspire us and inspire some other people with them. We want to see what you do. We want to see your work and we want to share it too. So, um, and everyone loves space. Like do. everybody, you, you could be, you know, you know, a bodybuilder that played football his whole life that lives in the city. I, I don't care. You, you like space. Everyone likes space. It's interesting. So, um, I don't know. Like I said, that's what we're here for. We want to share it with everybody. Well, and we're, we're really glad that you're here because um, what I've heard said is that astrophotography is the ultimate combination between art and science yeah and so it's got a subjective nature and an objective nature and and that's what makes it so beautiful and uh so let's and, create some art together yeah and we need your images also uh we'll on the next episode uh well really you can send them to chuck at explore scientific or ross at explore scientific but every week we want to you know feature an astrophotographer if you're just getting started if you know you're an expert it doesn't matter you know we want to feature you we want to see your work we want to talk to you um so if you have images and you would like to be on our show again send it to chuck at explore scientific or ross at explore scientific as well um i'm seeing uh book davies i couldn't imagine a g11 not being solid uh you're right they are solid they are rock solid um it's a tank and I've got the G811, so it's got the smaller December head, and uh, it's it's great. Um, however, however, let me let me give some honesty here. I've got a buddy uh, who uh, has has uh, the G11 with the mm -hmm. DMC8, and he, I sent him a picture one day, like, look at my PhD2 graph, my my tracking, my guiding graph. You know, I didn't, uh, I didn't go over two arc seconds once. And this guy just got the G811 PMC8 mount. He's got a huge, huge telescope on it. And he was like, oh, you know, he's had it for two weeks. And he's under one arc second. Um, what? So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, what, is, what is he using? Is he using um, any kind of... Uh, is he using the telescope drive master or anything like that to support that? You know, I, I'm not sure how he is doing. So he probably, uh, if I had to guess, cause I get on out. Cause I, a, I, I have be auto guided, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. he, he's definitely auto guided, but I've got the Skywatcher EQ six R pro and I've got mm -hmm. our access to PMC eight. And with both mm -hmm. of those mounts, I would put our mount against that other mount any day, but I'm always under one arc a second because I believe 
I spend a lot of time on polar alignment. Mm. That that uh, See, you can I actually you, yeah <laughs> you can do it by eye or if you're like I said if you're imaging well, they'll, your eye they'll don't, prevent like north and south drift. Um, yeah, but, but I've um, always noticed if my polar alignment's not great, you know my my guiding's not going to be great. So sure. I spend sure. a lot of time on polar alignment. Well, I uh, I have I do it visually um, with the oh, polar old alignment school. scope. Um, no, I, I'll tell you, three years ago, I got my first scope, um, and it was the Exos 2. And uh, I was so scared of that thing. I did not plug it in. I did not turn it on for three months. Um, I used it com manually the entire time. Uh, I really wanted to, uh, to learn how, how to use this thing and um, to polar align it manually and to just uh, to really build a good foundation. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't spend much time polar aligning, though. I have a spot that I go to almost every time, and the mount is, sits right there. And so I'll just make a few quick adjust, adjustments. I kind of put the Big Dipper and uh, Cassiopeia where it's supposed to be and get as close as I can. Um, and since I'm shooting wide field, that's the great benefit of wide field, and that's what all of you all need to know. Um, that's also another reason why I enjoy shooting it because it's so much easier. Um, it is a lot more forgiving. Oh, I mean, if you are really zoomed in, um, every error you make is magnified. Um, whereas you won't even notice an error if you're, if you're zoomed out and you've got a much bigger field of view. So, um, you know, we, we are really grateful and we are super happy to be here. And so next week, yeah. next week, it's the DSLR show. We're going to be touching on this. So if you have one of these in your house and you want to get started, this is all you need. Just, well, you're going to have to have a tripod. And go to a pawn shop. Get yeah, get, get a Walmart, get one for $15, $20. But we're going to go over the 500 rule. So basically that's stating, you know, how long you can have your exposure for without having bad star tracking. So we're going to go over that and uh, just the basics of how – well, I'll go over how we got started also, mm -hmm. but uh, basically we're going to focus on getting started with a DSLR. Yeah, DSLR and a lens, the kit lens that came with your camera. Um, because if, if you got that, you can take great pictures. And shockingly, I have just been seeing better and better and better pictures taken with the cell phone. And there's a lot of these cell phone adapters out there. Um, I've got this one hooked to a pair of binoculars. These are the Wings binoculars. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, and um, you know, so you can take a picture with your binoculars or your spotting scope or any anything that you have. Um, this device works quite well. And you know, all you need is one of these and a cell phone and you already got the cell phone. So, um, you know, it's not that, it's not that hard to get in the game. It, it might be hard to get one of those A-pod shots it yeah. might take a little time to get that, but to get in the game, it's not. And to have some fun, it's not that hard. No, so, uh, not at all. And also, uh, you know, some people, you know, if you get online and look, you're probably going to hear a bunch of people saying, oh, you need to get, you know, mm -hmm. a dob so you can, you know, manual find your targets and you can learn the night sky. I, I'm not against that. But you don't, you know, we're here to have fun. You know, you don't have to go by a, a set rules to, to mm -hmm. get into this. So, yeah. I don't know. That's that's another yeah. thing that we'll be covering, you Definitely. know, because. Well, and it's, it's, you know, the Internet has provided such a great, great resource because you can go to Astro Bin or a lot of these sites. Cloudy and Nights. Cloudy YouTube. Nights. And they will tell you, hey, this image was shot with. This camera, this lens, this telescope with this many photos, this filter, and you can see, hey, if I got that equipment, can I get that shot? And so you can set yourself goals, and you can keep improving and keep climbing up that that uh, that's that steep hill. Yeah, that learning curve. And also another thing that I even think of: most smartphone nowadays have you can shoot like a ten mm -hmm. second exposure. So, it, like I said, if you have a tripod and you're you have an iPhone that can or an Android that can shoot ten seconds exposures, and you're going camping. You can get, get the Milky Way. Yeah, you can get some great images with mm -hmm. that. So, so next week we're going to show you how to do that. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we'll touch on the DSLR also. And then, I mean, if you have to have the good thing, if you do have a DSLR and you have to have a mount, there's star trackers out there that range from a hundred to 
you know, four hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, again, you don't need that to get started, but I'm just saying you might not need anything to get started. Um, and uh, but but we're here to uh, help you all get your feet wet. We're here to have some fun. Take your questions. Also, send um, your images. Yes. Yes. We need your images. We love your images. That's why that's why we're doing it. Because we want to see your pictures too. And uh, so, uh, man, thanks Chuck. And thank you, Paul and Scott and Shubham for everybody being and making yeah. this. Uh, well, it's, it's not over yet. So uh, I, I do want, we have Cameron Gillis coming on to. Okay, okay awesome. good deal. Awesome. Yeah. Now well, we're, our free. segment's over with. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I do want to uh, recognize people that have been on the show. I've been chatting with them, and you guys have been uh, interacting with them a little bit. Um, uh, but we have uh, uh, we have Albert uh, uh, Kras, Kras, Krasniki, I think is how it's pronounced. Uh, uh, he's he seems to be new. Chris Larson is with us. Uh, Andrew Corkill, Harold Locke, um, Mike Wiesner says, "Fun Friday, everybody." Uh, Book Davies is with us. He's, uh, a lot of these people are uh, regulars uh, that uh, chat with us. Bergman Scooter. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, we've got um, Chris Larson on. He says, uh, hey, Andrew, Harold, Mike, Scooter. Scooter? Who's Scooter? Oh, Bookman Scooter. That's right. And Alberti and, of course, Scott Robertson crew. Thank you very much, man. Um, Jeff Wise is on with us. Um, we've got who else? Uh, Beatrice Hines was on. Martin Eastburn. Uh, Beatrice gave some great yeah, comments. Yeah, hey, Beatrice. Beatrice great comments. Yeah. <laughs> Keep them up. <laughs> you have fans back, Beatrice. Uh, Martin says, howdy. It's all rainy. It's all. It's a rainy Friday for East Texas. Yeah, I love East Texas, Martin. I, I remember going to Glen Rose. You know, it was really beautiful out there. Um, uh, let's see, Cameron Gillis, just kind of looking through who else, I, I always miss somebody. Um, we had, uh, Dennis Dunderdale, uh, from Cotter, Arkansas. So, uh, thanks for watching Dennis. That's great. Kind of a local, local guy here. Um, and uh, El Mico L. Howdy from Phoenix. Thank Howdy. you, El Mico. That you're, you seem to be new. That's great. Um, or maybe you've been watching and, and we have missed you. So sorry about that if that's true. Uh, Connor Bradley, is anyone welcome to join the Zoom? Uh, Connor and I chatted a little bit. I did invite him to, um, he's a visual astronomer. Uh, I invited him to submit a presentation uh, for us. We are going to have the next Global Star Party Tuesday, and it's going to be uh, supported uh, by our special guest host, the Nebraska Star Party guys, okay? So they're going to have an in-person star party, but they agreed to do this global star party on top of it. So that's kind of a, a prelude to the real deal, okay? Yeah, that's awesome. So that's going to be Thank cool. Uh, John Johnson will be uh, uh, certainly participating in, in that along with a bunch of other people. So it's going to be cool. Um, let's see, and who else? Varamis kind of, Corkill? Kind of scrolling through. What's that? Varamis Corkill? Great Friday show. That, that, is, that is Andrew Corkill. Uh, okay. okay, good deal. Yeah, Andrew and I used to work together at Mead Instruments. So, oh, okay. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. But he does own one of our telescopes. He has an Explore Scientific airspace triplet, and he's got it's a ED one fifty two, and uh, he's got uh, it on a Blasmandi G eleven in his own private backyard observatory. So he's he's kind of he's getting really really serious about this. And it's totally cool. No, that's awesome. That's an awesome setup. Mm hmm. We'll have to tease him into getting into astrophotography, which I don't think will be real hard. So, um, well, and, I do uh, remember Shubham had said uh, he really liked it because he could go so much deeper 
um, with a long exposure, picking up a really oh sure magnitude stars. Right. Is, when uh, you have a really dependable, smooth mount like that, you know, this kind of I always believed in more mount than you got telescope. So, you know, so, I use yeah. a ED-102 mounted on a G-11. You could probably hit it with a small baseball bat and it would be okay during an exposure. Um, just joking. Um, uh, let's see. Well, I do love uh, the Lowe's <laughs> Indy and it's, it's a great, it's a great uh, blend, you know, with the PMC-8. Uh, yeah. Lowe's Indy is very, very high quality product. Dennis says, uh, great show, folks. I need to get back on the road. Pulled over to watch for a little bit, uh, but I need to get home and start the holiday weekend. That's right. Well, we have thank you for pulling July off the side coming, of the road to watch right? us. That's awesome. That's a big deal. Uh, Dodie Reagan says, hello from Texas Hill Country. That's where we're looking at going for the 2023 eclipse and the 2024 eclipse. So more about that later. Um, and uh okay so i think that that kind of gets most of the audience there if i missed you i'm sorry uh but uh, we love we love having you watch and we have we love uh, interacting with you uh cameron uh you've got calibration frames on your mind what what do you got to share with us just a little thing well first of all recognition uh it was great to see uh, shubham join the crew and yes uh, great right. great uh, debut uh, Chuck and 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 Ross, uh, fantastic stuff. This is a uh, good good uh, good material, and I love your, you know, walk before you or crawl before you walk approach. You know, uh, and make it very accessible. And uh, yeah, um, so with that in mind, um, I just wanted to spend two minutes. Um, I have been working on improving my. I'm going to have to turn off my. Uh, screen here sorry turn off my virtual background and, i see uh, a ghost yeah, yeah. don't worry there we go it's that so this is my <laughs> well, um, that's what it is okay i've taken some pictures uh, on, on in vsi air uh, uh with my mc a 294 mc uh camera mm -hmm. and um and what I've noticed is uh, if you look at the images down here, like uh, here, here there, there's a lot of big netting, right? Uh, you mm -hmm. see the brightening in the middle. And then also you see quite a bit of noise. Obviously it's an uncooled camera, right? Um, and then I, I, what I wanna do, and this is, not, this is not fully baked yet, but I wanna go in a future show. I'm, I'm going through, I'm gonna be starting to test uh, over this weekend. Uh, during the day, I did a bunch of darks and flats and, um, and also did the uh, uh, bias frames um, uh, uh, during the day. And, you know, it was around 30 degrees temperature, 30 degrees Celsius uh, was the temperature sensor. And I was able to make it sufficiently dark and, and play around with my settings to be able to uh, test this out. And so what, I've, uh, what I'm doing, uh, and actually maybe... I should show my phone. This is going to get a little bit, uh, little bit convoluted. But give me a second. I'm going to let me show you how I how I set it set up here. Uh, ah, here we go. So you can see uh, the picture here. I you know I'll have this properly done. What I did is for the uh, for the um, bias frames. I, uh, I I got I put a, a pillowcase over uh, over the objective, and that way I could get enough light in uh, in a flat relatively flat field. And then if you look at it, uh, I use the dew shield to keep it taunt, so it wouldn't mm -hmm. create any ripples. Yeah, so you have good. a nice contiguous, uh, you know, you have a nice steady flat field, so to speak. Now, this is for okay. bias frame or for flat field? Flat frames, it's got to be. This is for this is for flats. Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks. So and I, so I, yeah. So and I'll explain uh, my. I'm just learning about bias flats and uh, darks, and I'll explain what I know so far, and then we'll, we'll we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna have some before and after and, and some more details, so we can really get everyone to understand the concept um, as I'm learning myself. So yeah, you know, and I and I I did that. So basically, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's yeah, that's all. That's other stuff. Uh, so. What I wanted to show you is um, here are 
so these are the um, the uh, the uh, um, the bias frames, um, which are um, uh, which, uh, the, the bias frames are to remove the read noise on mm. your uh, your camera, and it creates these lines you can see, right? So if you zoom in, you can see this noise lines, and this is what happens if you start taking pictures and you, uh, without any of these correction frames in it. Uh, what will happen is all your pictures will will have these lines going through it, and that's the bias, and that's just built into the electronics. So you want it, those are very short exposures, and uh, you just take uh, like one millisecond. Uh, you know, I take a hundred of those, and and basically uh, that gets the temperature up, and then it basically does a bunch. And you you look at all these; they're a little bit different noise every time. So these are just different frames. So that's the bias. Okay, so that's those are those are easy to take. You can take a, a lot of them, and that will get rid of those line noises. The next one is darks. Darks are you 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 cover the the uh, your 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 uh, camera or your telescope, um, and you can take this again anytime as long as you keep it dark in the image trains, and then you basically take your thirty second or you know whatever exposure you're you're taking your light frames with. You take a bunch of those and you'll see it gets rid of stuff like this. Uh, you see this glow on the top right. There's a, this is an amp glow. And if you go to the bottom, you can see, you'll also see some, uh, some glow there. Let me just go to another one. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, that's not a good one. Yeah, it will also get rid of awesome. amp glows. Sorry, it's just bouncing around a bit there. Go ahead, yeah. Now they, I was just saying they get rid of the noise also. Hot pixels. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, have you tried dark flats yet? Instead no, no, of no. And, and I'm just doing I'm just doing the darks and then I'm gonna I, I've just done the flats and that and that's that's this one here. So if I go here, here's a good flat example, right? And uh, so the flat, to your point, that gets rid of the big netting that the you know the, the, the where you have the brightness in the middle. And then, of course, the edges. I didn't do these before. So all my images, I had darks and I had bias in there. So I got rid of the noise and that. But I always had this big netting uh, because yeah. I never did I never did that. So you, you absolutely need to use this. And here's an interesting thing I observed. If you take a look at this picture, you'll notice, uh, and I just figured this out, and I, you guys can tell me if I'm if I'm right here. The Bayer pattern on your on your uh, color CCD is RGGB. Okay, so it's a pattern, and I'll show no, a picture. Normally, of this. normally, yeah, yeah depends normal, on the normally. camera you're using. Depends on the camera you're using, but what you can That's see awesome. here, if you if you look carefully, is I was noticing no matter which orientation I point, uh, the bottom left is red, and then these two quadrants are green, and then the top right is blue. And if you zoom in, you can actually start to see the pixels. These are more blue pixels. These are more green pixels. And then mm -hmm. same with the opposite corner, they're more green. You see that? And then finally, uh, uh, you have the red here. And that's an interesting byproduct. Uh, must be because of the polarization, the angle in which the light comes in uh, on that. But some interesting physics. Anyhow, just an observation I noticed uh, when taking yes. this. Um, on color cameras, flats are more difficult, and uh... usually you want to use so on flats. You on a color camera, especially on my on the ASI two ninety four MC Pro, the cool version. Uh, you know, usually flats are really fast, like under a second. But actually, uh, on some cameras, you want to run a longer flat so you get you know a color consistency mm -hmm. and uh, you know light the. the the, the correct light pattern essentially yeah the dynamic range right i mean yeah. uh, you you need to have the right range because what happened is the reason why i wanted to show you this this is an example of an overexposed flat yeah right, where, where you just blow it out and i realized because this was like a you know 30 second and i was shining a, a bright light and it's like no you don't actually want to do that you want you you want to go with a fainter light and in fact with longer exposures I, I used two pillowcases mm -hmm. to darken this so mm -hmm. that what would happen is you'd, you'd actually be able to have that dynamic range right. from the, the uh, otherwise, it, it, like you say, it becomes yeah. totally useless. This is useless for me because it's all blown out, right? 
So, uh, so I, I, but I'm going to still, for fun, I'm going to see what happens when I mer merge those in. But I believe the correct way of doing this is, is, is to try to get the right exposure so the center is, is at maximum satura saturation. And then you have a, a, a continuum, right? So you basically optimize the light that's coming into the front so that you, you can actually measure the curvature and the, uh, the changing brightness of your field. I believe so. But I'm, I'm going to I'm going to test I'm going to start merging these these uh, um, I guess these are the uh, the flats I'm going to start merging these flats into my stacking and and uh, let's see what happens so uh, uh, to be continued but I just wanted to show you you know I, I I show you kind of my work in progress and and I know you guys are the experts so I I, I just wanted to be able to contribute a little bit you know uh, as we go through this journey together so anyhow that's that's my little yeah. Hey, Cameron, today. thank you. Uh, but, but Chug and I are certainly not the experts, um, but we've got we've got some experts here for sure. And I think we all know who those guys are. But uh, yeah, we yeah, Ka uh, Cameron, we, we love it. And, you know, those flats um, when you get uh, when you get those narrow band filters, those flats can really increase uh, the exposure time. But um, or go away, depending on the camera yeah, that you're or, using or go away. Um, and then your gain level too uh, can sometimes cause you to need more flats. But, yes, uh, yes, I played with that. Well, as well. Uh, you know, you really don't need much more than a two or three second. I, what I've read is, is that you really look at your histogram. Yeah, you want to. You want uh, you know, in a colored camera, you got red, blue, and green. You want those. You want your points in the middle. If you're looking, uh, that's how I go middle off of or it. Middle left. Yeah, I middle left. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. That basically, uh, you really want to be looking at your histograms when you're taking your flats. The way I do it, and people do it so many ways, I use a light panel and I put mm -hmm. three sheets of white paper on that light panel on the dimmest setting. And then I rubber band a white t shirt around my dew shield. And um, I think my ADU is at 2400. And that gives me, with the ASI 294 MC Pro, that gives me perfect flats running at three seconds. I don't know how it'd work with, uh, I think it would be similar, even though it's it's not a cool camera, I really think it would work just the same, so. Well, I'll I mean, let you know how it goes, and we, we should, there's probably, probably multiple ways of doing this, but uh, I, it would be wonderful to exchange notes. And like I say, I, what I'm gonna yeah. do is I'm gonna take some different pictures at different uh, exposures, and and, uh, and I'll show you the kind of, if I include the flats or if I, if I take out the flats, uh, what the difference in performances, uh, well, hey, stuff Cameron, like that. One thing I've read too, that you, you probably already know, but, um, with an uncooled camera, they do say that you want to take your, um, your, your darks and your flats, uh, the, the night of. So, I mean, the temperature yeah. is as close as you can get. So you are not subtracting, uh, good data. Um, and you're you're getting all the read noise you can, and all the noise you can out of there. Um, that's a, that's, yeah, you that's just leave your scope out, and you point it away from the sun, correct? At dawn or evening time. Yeah, I never had much success with that. I always um, did it inside. I never. I um. Well, I never had much success with flats for a long time. Yeah. And, and that that was a color camera issue, and kind of what what Cameron was just showing uh showing everybody there. And it just didn't, uh, it didn't seem to be doing a good job. Or, you know, if your, if your uh, camera rotates a little bit, all your flats are ruined. Uh, no. Because now you'll have two dust bunnies where mm -hmm. there was just one. Yeah. Um, Jeff so I, I had to get a, I had to get a flat master, a Pegasus flat master. And oh, okay. Uh, it's worked out for you. Jeff Wise is commenting. He says he's up to six t-shirts to do, to do his flats. He says, technically, the exact color, the light, and even, evenness is very important. Not all light panels are evenly lit. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. That's why I was putting those sheets of paper in front of, uh, in front of that light uh, panel. Well, hey, I'm glad you can relate with this here, Chris Larson. Um, yeah, we... <laughs> The calibration photos have always been a difficult. And that's what brings as I'm sorry. That's like that's what that's what can bring down astrophotography is those calibration frames because you need them and they can be really difficult. I mean, really not. I mean, as far as flats, it's flat, time consuming. If, you, if it's four in the morning and you've got to start plugging stuff in 
and uh, moving stuff around. Uh, it at four in the morning, it's pretty hard to do some of that stuff. Yeah, I, I was thinking, I was taking advantage of uh, you know some when it clouds over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's like okay, no, that's hey, very smart, it's, Cameron. Yeah, the, the, the end of the night, it's time. like okay, you know what? I'm gonna use this time to to take some some darks, um, yeah. and and then I was experimenting because it got so hot here, uh, you know, and, and uh, that I was like, hey, I'm gonna do this during the day uh, on a cooler day, and then it, it, you know, it's it's kind of like a hot night. So so I I figured that to your point, yeah, you do want to make sure the temperature. I don't have. That one of the biggest advantages of cool, besides obviously the lower noise, is you can set the temperature. So you, you what, what you, you, even in, even in the daytime, you can you can set it so you can you can take all your darks, flats, and bias uh, at the at the calibrated temperature. So you don't have to worry about doing it at night. Um, so I so I I'm trying to what we're what I my objective is the same as you guys. We want to make this so that it's really easy. Uh, we figure out some kind of tips. So that anyone can, you know, in this team can can uh, can can do it and and repeat it and and have the same success without the frustrations, right? Because uh, well, you Cameron, know, we're, like we're, we were talking about yeah. earlier, um, and you said, you know, you just recently started taking uh, taking the flats, um, but the images before the flats, you loved them too, and that's how you mm-hmm. got to the flats. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah, the. You don't have to do all of this. You just got to get out there and get under the stars, man, and start looking. You got up. it, man. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's all about. And it, what, what's what's addicting is is when you can achieve that those in, in uh, those initial steps. Then mm-hmm, you get hooked exactly. and you say, "Oh, I want to do a little bit." So what what's driving me to do this is like, "Hey, I want to get a little better." Like like I tell you, I'm doing the sky survey, and it's it's not it's crude pictures. However, every time I do that, it's like, "Ah, I want to make that a little bit better." And so your technique, you start to add not only the fun of the regular observing, but you also uh, add new improvements along the way. So it's a, it's a, it's an ongoing, uh, it's a wonderful thing. So you kind of two different dimensions, right? One axis is just the pure timeline of enjoyment of whatever you're doing. And then the second is, hey, let's improve, right? Let's do, make it a little bit more cooler, right? So uh, it's, uh, and then you add more gear, you know, you, but you find out also what you need and also uh, what you don't need and, and to be able to achieve what you want to do. So it's cool. Yeah, that's exactly right, Cameron. And that's another goal of our show is to get you to find out what you need and what you don't need. Because um, if you spend 300 bucks a few times on things you don't need, you know, then you're not going to be able to afford the thing you need or really want. So that, that that's what we want to do. And we want to... Uh, I want to get everybody improving. Because yeah. Hopefully by the end of the show, Chuck and I will be a lot better too because of y'all and because of this opportunity. Right. Awesome. Yeah, it goes back to what Scott was saying, how, um, you know, when I first started out, I had it in my head that I had to have the best telescope. But in reality, I needed, I mean, I needed a good mount. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the mount is definitely more important than the telescope for sure because that's so your, much more. Yes. I mean, that's the lot yeah. of astrophotography. So it really is. Yeah. It really and is. I, actually, I, I, I'm really passionate about. Sorry, uh, I'm really passionate about the mount as well. I mean, this to me, uh, this this journey I've been taking. I, I made my big switch from 18 inch daub, right, which was on a beautiful mount, but it didn't have tracking, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and it's it's really meant for going out there in the dark skies and uh, i switched that over to an eight inch schmack schmack cassegrain uh on a, on an on an altaz it was go to but it's still an altaz but it was it was a much better experience for me in my backyard because i could actually take advantage of my observing capabilities and still and be able to track and start off with astrophotography all at the same mm-hmm. time and that actually led me to realize I need an equatorial mount. And that's what led me to explore scientific as well with the PMC-8, uh, you know, the I-axis 2, which is what I want to get. Obviously, I want the G- G-11. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. That's the, the holy grail. But, um, but you know, for, for now, if I can, it will be a nice pairing to have the, the mount my C-8 on top of a GM, uh, you know, sorry, on top of the Exus 2. Yeah. That, that's the right weight balance. And then I would like to piggyback uh, my ED80 on top of that, so I can do both wide field and long focal length at the same time. But these are all, uh, you know, this is all things that I've learned along the way on what I need, right? 
and the way I want to use the gear. Mm -hmm. And so everything you guys are doing and what Scott has done in this show really helps uh, everyone maximize their enjoyment. Yeah. Um, totally. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, All for right. sure. We're trying to do. Yeah, guys, I, uh, you know, I was uh, kind of following some of the uh, comments from Gary Albin, who's watch who has been watching the show. He's he's getting set up for uh, trying to weather the storm for uh, Hurricane Elsa. So if you guys, anybody out there that's, uh, uh, you know, in, in that region, you know, certainly take care um, and, uh, you know, uh, do what you got to do to weather the storm. So. Um, until that time, you know, it looks like we got, uh, great things lined up for next Friday, uh, next Friday show. And, um, uh, you know, I love that we're highlighting new astrophotographers that are coming on. Shabam, thank you very much again for being part of, uh, of this program. You're welcome back on when you got, uh, when you have some more stuff to show. Okay. It's going to be fun. So, um, and, uh, Next week, we, of course, have uh, Daniel Barth in uh, his next segment of How Do You Know? Tuesday, we've got the 53rd Global Star Party uh, that is going to be, the special guest host is going to be in the Nebraska Star Party crew, okay? So as I mentioned before, they are actually having a real star party, uh, which happens, I think, August 1st through 6th. Uh, but uh, I wanted to get these guys onto the program to talk about Nebraska Star Party, to share some past experiences. It's been a, you know, it's been a while since they've, uh, a lot of these people have actually been out under the stars with, uh, you know, in that uh, Nebraska Star Party area. So um, if you haven't been to that Star Party, it's, you should definitely put it on your bucket list. It is ultra dark uh, and it's a really, really friendly crew and they run a great Star Party. So um anything else you guys would like to add before we uh wind it up i'm more than thanks i'm not sure yeah i yeah. mean we're looking forward to the show this i mean awesome yeah like I, said, I like this i like this, I like this new computers. format this side-by-side -side format you guys have going on great setup. Uh, great setup. that was set up by uh, uh paul we newton who's our videographer it. here so we can we he's, can finally take our giving it some now. polish here i like that Okay. Um, well, uh, until Monday, you guys have a great weekend. Have a great uh, 4th of July and uh, uh, keep looking up and we'll talk to you later. Have a good one. Happy, happy, right. Thanks, Cameron. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Everybody. Thanks, everyone.